one of the most amazing superheroes of all time, refreshed and rebooted for a new generation, ultimately thriving in an oversaturated market of superheroes, ninjas, and mutants, a canon event resulting in a web of spectacular licensed merchandise and the restoration of his status as a mainstream pop culture icon, all thanks to Batman. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Spider-Man the Animated Series. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code GALAXY50 for 50% 50 off your first box today. It's the moment that I dread every single day. It's the last question I want to hear. And even though I know it's coming, I never have a good answer for it. What do you want to do for dinner? There are plenty of foods I love, but planning for which ones I'm going to eat every day is a task that I am not built for. Lucky for me, Factor takes that off my plate and replaces it with good, healthy food. They do everything but cook it for me. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes, which is perfect for busy lifestyles. They sweat the tough stuff so you don't have to. Their registered dietitians work hand in hand with their kitchen to ensure every meal is made from scratch with nutritious ingredients. Amp up your Factor order with add-ons like proteins, juices, energy bites, veggie sides, desserts, and more. And don't worry, Factor snacks and desserts accommodate those following plant-based and keto diets. Too busy with your end of summer goals to cook, but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, you skip the trip to the grocery store, skip the chopping, skip the prepping, skip the cleanup. All you have to do is heat and enjoy. Feel your best for the rest of the summer. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code GALAXY50 to get 50% off your first Factor box today. That's factor75.com, code GALAXY50. And thanks again to Factor. Spider-Man the Animated Series originally aired 65 episodes over five seasons from November of 1994 to January of 1998. From day one, it was a must-watch weekly appointment on the Fox Kids Network for Fox Kids, Fox Teens, and Fox Adults. Peter Parker is a student at Empire State University, just a regular guy like you and me trying to make his way through life. He lives with his aunt, he works part-time as a freelance photographer at the Daily Bugle, and he's got the proportionate speed and strength of a spider. Peter got his powers when he was in high school attending an exhibit on neogenics. A radioactive spider bit him. He adopted a costumed identity. He used his new powers for personal gain. He let a criminal go. That criminal murdered his uncle Ben. Peter blamed himself for his uncle's death. Biff Bang Pow, New York's got a friendly neighborhood superhero. Now it's a daily struggle against an ever-expanding group of supervillains, which honestly wouldn't be that bad if he could just figure out the Peter Parker half of his life. Because there's nothing Venom, the Green Goblin, or Dr. Octopus can do to him that's worse than the things he has to deal with being a regular guy trying to make ends meet and navigating his love life while living in the city that never sleeps and secretly saving the world as Spider-Man. Spider-Man the Animated Series was an adaptation of Spider-Man the Comics. After Stan Lee and Jack Kirby created the Fantastic Four in 1961, Stan Lee and Steve Ditko created Spider-Man in 1962. Stan Lee has said that he was looking for a new kind of superhero, a teenager that wasn't a sidekick. Marvel kicked off a renaissance of comic books that humanized superheroes, where previously they had been aspirational icons or power fantasies about adults with fantastic godlike abilities. Marvel characters dealt with everyday problems like rent, part-time jobs, racism, schoolwork, things their readers could relate to. Despite the fact that Peter Parker was a teenager, Stanley has said that he called him Spider-Man because he couldn't stay Spider-Boy forever. He wanted readers to watch Peter grow up, to learn from Spider-Man's battles against Dr. Octopus and Peter Parker's battles against paying the electric bill. Spider-Man made his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy issue 15 in June of 1962, illustrated by Steve Ditko with cover art by Jack Kirby. Marvel publisher Martin Goodman wasn't particularly excited about Spider-Man, but agreed to run it since Amazing Fantasy was being canceled, and that was the last issue anyway. Ah, but fate had a different path for Spider-Man. Goodman couldn't deny the astonishing sales numbers, and Spider-Man quickly moved into his own book. The Amazing Spider-Man issue 1 hit newsstands in March of 1963. Steve Ditko not only designed Spider-Man's iconic costume, but carried the bulk of the storytelling as he fleshed out characters and stories based on brief plot outlines from Lee. It wasn't long before Spider-Man was the most popular character at Marvel Comics and an international pop culture icon. Spider-Man grew in popularity and appeared on television first from 1967 to 1970 with the cartoon Spider-Man, followed by a regular live-action segment called Spidey Super Stories from 1974 to 1977 on the kids' television series The Electric Company. In 1977, he got a primetime television series starring Nicholas Hammond, and just a year later in 1978, Toei included him in their own live-action superhero series where his powers came from aliens, and he got to drive a giant robot. 
1981, Marvel Productions produced Spider-Man, a 26-episode animated series, and 24 episodes of a second animated series called Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. Both series ended by 1983. However, those 50 episodes combined were then rebroadcast as part of a new Marvel Action Universe programming block alongside Robocop and Dino Riders beginning in 1988. 1989 was a big year for comics. Batman, directed by Tim Burton, starring Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, hit the big screen and changed the mainstream perception of comic book-inspired properties as being merely kid stuff. It made $400 million in ticket sales and over $500 million in licensed merchandise, including toys produced by Toy Biz. 1992 brought the first sequel, Batman Returns, and a gritty, pulpy new cartoon to Fox Kids, Batman the Animated Series. The success of Batman in 1989 spurred the production of other comic-based properties, including Marvel's X-Men the Animated Series, also accompanied by a line of Toy Biz action figures, also airing on Fox Kids. Produced by Saban Entertainment, inspired by the record-selling comic books, X-Men the Animated Series helped solidify Fox Kids as the most important network for animated superhero entertainment. Fox Kids grew fast in a short time thanks to veteran leaders like Margaret Lesh. She joined Fox Kids two years earlier in 1990 after new ownership took over at Marvel Productions, a company she had been working for since 1984. She executive produced everything from G.I. Joe to Transformers, Gem, Dungeons & Dragons, Dino Riders, Muppet Babies, Robocop, and Rude Dog and the Dweebs. That's two different shows, Robocop and Rude Dog and the Dweebs. Can you imagine? <laughs> The combination of Batman, X-Men, and in 1993, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers practically guaranteed that landing a series on the network would be a hit, selling millions in licensed merchandise. Marvel Entertainment Group, on the other hand, were undergoing a drastic shift in their corporate structure and desperately looking for a hit. For Marvel, 1993 was the year that they essentially became a toy development company. Sales were struggling after seven of the most popular, highest-selling artists in the industry, including Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane, walked out in 1992 to form their own company called Image Comics. Comics. Lee and McFarlane had been the driving forces behind the astronomical rise in popularity of the X-Men and Spider-Man, respectively. To help stop the bleeding, Marvel traded exclusive, perpetual, royalty-free licenses of Marvel characters to Toy Biz in exchange for 46% of equity in Toy Biz. From that point on, everything in their creative pipeline, from comics to television, was produced with toys in mind. A new film and television company called Marvel Films was created, which included a subsidiary called Marvel Films Animation, both under the direction of newly appointed president and CEO Avi Arad, who had previously been president and CEO of Toy Biz. With the X-Men already on television, the focus turned to Spider-Man. Batman the Animated Series was one of the most popular shows on television thanks in no small part to the visual style and more dramatic, more mature storytelling. Where previous superhero cartoons were made for five to eight-year-olds, Batman attracted an older audience. Batman brought in teens and adults with jobs and money to spend on things like action figures. Coming next Saturday to Fox. <laughs> The television event you've been waiting for with the amazing superhero who's worth waiting for, Spider-Man. It's the special sneak preview you can't miss. Watch the all-new Spider-Man coming next Saturday morning to Fox Kids. It'll transform you. Marvel attempted to siphon off as much of that bat essence as they could to inject into a new Spider-Man series. They recruited Batman the Animated Series writer and story editor Martin Pasco to be showrunner for Spider-Man. Spider-Man was too important with too much writing on it to settle for someone without a proven track record. That said, Stan Lee reached out to John Semper, who had previously worked for Marvel Productions. If they couldn't get Pasco, Spider-Man needed to get on air one way or another, so it made sense to reach out to the guy who wrote 17 episodes of the Fraggle Rock cartoon and co-created the Kid and Play animated series. Among other things... According to Semper, a few months into production, Stanley called him again, this time to say it was an emergency and they needed him to come in right away. Pasco wasn't working out and they wanted to fire him. Lee was given the go-ahead to bring in Semper and write the production before it crashed. Semper knew from the beginning that Marvel Films president and CEO Avi Arad intended for the series to be, quote, one big toy commercial. That put some restrictions on him, including a direct order not to produce any season-long plot lines. And he was frequently told which characters to include in episodes because toys were already on the way. 
But Semper stood his ground and pushed for more value to be placed on storytelling because he knew that a great show would sell toys better than anything. It made him some enemies in the executive offices and almost got him fired, but he insisted that season-long plot lines would ensure that viewers made it a point to watch every episode every week. And he was right. Samper was one of the most frequent and most prolific contributors to writing the series with credits on 60 out of the 65 total episodes, using story concepts from individual issues of the comics over its four decades of existence to Toei's live-action Spider-Man. He credits Leopard on directly as the inspiration for the robot used by an alternate reality version of Peter Parker. Like every other animated series before it, Spider-Man had to meet broadcast standards and practices which limit the depiction of things like violence, the occult, and adult situations. Those concerns were amplified by a perception that violence in children's television was becoming normalized thanks to shows like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The result could be seen in the character Morbius, who, as a vampire, was not allowed to use his fangs to suck blood. Instead, he had suckers on his hands and fed off plasma. Writers weren't even allowed to use the word blood. The Sinister Six was renamed the Insidious Six. Characters weren't allowed to break windows, and furthermore, there should be no depictions of broken glass at all. Semper's favorite notes included the directive that when Spider-Man lands on a roof, he shouldn't harm any pigeons, and a villain can be sent to jail, but they may not be given a bus ticket. And sent to Florida. At first I feel like that last one needs more context, but then I remember what Florida is like and it makes sense, and I can say that as someone who was born in Florida. Spider-Man featured an all-star cast with Christopher Daniel Barnes as Peter Parker and Spider-Man, Linda Gary as Aunt May, Neil Ross as the Green Goblin, Hank Azaria as Eddie Brock and Venom. Special guests included Roscoe Lee Brown, Earl Bowen, Majel Barrett, David Warner, and Mark Hamill, but nothing can top J. Jonah Jameson as portrayed by Ed Asner. Kids in the 90s were straight up spoiled. Who who told you you could offer Parker his job back? That goofy kid couldn't focus if his life depended on it. Music for the series was produced by Saban Entertainment, the same Saban Entertainment that was producing the X-Men animated series and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and a lot of other stuff. Joe Perry, lead guitarist for Aerosmith, performed the opening theme, which was written by Shuki Levy. Spider-Man ran for five seasons on Fox Kids, 65 total episodes with a lot of unresolved plot lines. According to Semper, they intentionally left season five on a cliffhanger because they thought they were going to get picked up for at least one, if not two more seasons. One theory behind the cancellation was that Fox Kids president Margaret Lesh was not a fan of Marvel Films' Avi Arad and had a much better working relationship with Saban Entertainment. Once the 65 episode order for Spider-Man was completed, she canceled the series to stick it to Arad and Marvel Films' animation. Spider-Man was followed by Spider-Man Unlimited, a spiritual successor produced by Saban in 1999. However, according to Semper, it was merely a budgetary decision. 65 episodes were ordered, 65 episodes were delivered. There was no corporate desire to place another order for another 65 episodes. The existing 65 could be rerun into the future as needed. Spider-Man the Animated Series was featured in games for the Super NES and Sega Genesis. There were Spider-Man lunchboxes, storybook cereal, and clothing all inspired by the cartoon. McDonald's released a line of Happy Meal toys based on the series. All of that is secondary to the comprehensive toy line produced by Toy Biz. The whole point from the beginning was to sell the toys and sell the toys they did. Figures, playsets, vehicles, roleplay items, action features, theme subsets, and more. The toys were so popular and sold so well that the line continued after the animated series was canceled and today is being revisited in the current line of Hasbro Marvel Legends. Will they run the table and produce anti-vampire Spider-Man with spinning sunlight blaster? Time will tell. Cartoon and Toy Line was a two-way street with Semper confessing that while it was inconvenient at times to have to work the toys into the series, he managed to work a character into the Toy Line by using her in the show. Avi Arad didn't want to use Madam Web because he didn't think kids would want a figure of some old lady. Nonetheless, Toy Biz released her in 1998. Semper calls her one of his most prized possessions. Will her sneak attack, flip and trap action be featured on the upcoming Disney Plus series? Time will tell. If you missed it the first time around, you can find some of the episodes on DVD. The series is currently owned by the Walt Disney Company. All 65 episodes can be viewed at your leisure via the Disney Plus streaming service. Spider-Man the Animated Series brought Spider-Man back into the mainstream bigger than ever before paving the way for what would come in the future, including live action and animated films. Years before Into the Spider-Verse was featured in the comics or the movies, Spider-Man the Animated Series explored the possibilities of... The Multiverse. The last two episodes of the series feature multiple spider characters from across dimensions, including a universe where Peter Parker is carnage, and furthermore, that Peter Parker is going to use a bomb powered by a time dilation accelerator to destroy the multiverse. 
The multiverse would pop up again in a series of video games including 2010's Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, Christopher Daniel Barnes returned to voice Peter Parker and Spider-Man Noir, co-written by Dan Slott who would go on to write the 2014 Spider-Verse Comics crossover story for Marvel Comics, the multiverse would be a repeated touchpoint culminating in the 2018 film Into the Spider-Verse and its 2023 sequel Across the Spider-Verse. Spider-Man the Animated Series is currently owned by Disney. It was part of their purchase of Fox Kids and Saban in 2001, but it likely would have found its way there eventually after Disney purchased Marvel in 2009 or as part of their multi-year content licensing agreement with Sony in 2021. Spider-Man the Animated Series introduced a whole new generation to the friendly neighborhood web-slinger, re-establishing him atop the pop culture pyramid as one of the most beloved and valuable assets in the Marvel library. It set the stage for two decades of live-action films, animated series, comic books, and toys that is still going strong today. It helped save Marvel Comics from bankruptcy, and it might not have happened were it not for Batman. That last clap means relax. It's, it's <laughs> over, you did it. Thanks for watching, please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are, if you are in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to our videos ad-free, as well as behind the scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and an exclusive monthly podcast about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below if you were as excited as I was when this series was airing. Even though I was in college when it started, I was fully on board with a new Spider-Man show on the heels of Batman and the X-Men. It was like the TV gods had finally heard us long time Marvel fans begging for a new series and it was everything I hoped it would be. I watched it every Saturday morning, I bought all the toys and then I lost track of it by the second or third season because I was an adult, had work to do and work and stuff. I didn't love it so much that I was going to record it or anything. I did my part. I got it on the air. Marvel and Toy Biz made millions of dollars. You're welcome. <laughs> Cut. What did I get out of this? <laughs>